Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Senator Doug Black. Senator, my first question to all my guests that I usually have is, where did your sense of duty come from? That's a great question. I have been asked that before. It comes basically from my mom and dad. Both of my parents, my father is still alive, my mother passed a couple of years or so ago, uh, were huge believers in the power of community. And even, I mean, to this day, my dad still goes to Rotary at 95. My mom was very involved with uh, handicapped kids, And I saw from an early age that there was an expectation on people who were blessed, and we've always felt never wealthy, but always blessed, uh, that we had an obligation to give back. So that's absolutely where it comes from. And now there's many avenues that you can give back in, and you chose to give back Mm -hmm. in the political field. Were your mother and father Mm -hmm. politically active as well, or did you, were you sort of the black sheep? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And the more I get involved, the blacker the sheep I become. People say to me and my family, like, Doug, like, are you crazy? Are you absolutely crazy? But no, before I did this, I've done a lot in education, you know, community work in education. I've done, a, I would say, a great deal of work in fundraising for arts groups. So I've always, always been involved, always been involved. But when you're building your career and you're building your family, uh, there's, there is only so much time. So it was basically after my career was built and I had uh, basically begun to transition from the act of practice of law <clears throat> and my kids were raised that uh, I decided I could make a fulsome contribution. Now, it is fair to say I had no idea what I was hiding <laughs> like no idea because I'd kind of bought into the notion of what a senator is supposed to do. And this senator, i.e. me, doesn't do what I thought a senator is supposed to do. Like, I've never worked harder. I've never worked more publicly. I've never worked under more pressure uh, than I currently do. But it's fabulous. I mean, it's it's a fabulous privilege is how I feel it, uh, is how I view it. <clears throat> and uh, you talk about your Senate career already. Uh, in 2012, you made the decision to run for a, an election here in Alberta for a senator's uh, seat in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. What was that decision like? Was it hard to finally say, you know what, I'm going to put my name <laughs> forward for the senator's job? Or was it easy to say, you know what, no, I, I could be a senator? <laughs> Uh, well, I listen, I had no idea at all. Pals of mine, you know, people who are still very engaged in politics and Doug, look, this is this opportunity exists. You'd be fabulous. We'll get behind you. And maybe we were having beers. I don't know. Maybe we were golfing. I don't know what we were doing. But I said, sure. Having no idea that first of all, I had to get the nomination of the party. And then after you get the nomination of the party, then you've got to get the support of Albertans across 87 ridings. Then you've got to get the prime minister of the day to appoint you. (laughs) So let's just say a lot of this was news at seven to me. I have no (laughs) idea. And a couple of nights of actually, I think I remember four nights quite early in the campaign. I literally fell into bed. I was so exhausted. And I said to my wife, I can't do this one more day. I can't do this one more day. And she sensibly said, Doug, there's too many people now working for you, with you, supporting you. You got no choice. So he's got to dig deep and press on. Then I decided I'm going to make it fun. And we had a blast. We had a blast because I never, ever thought I was going to win. I never, ever thought Really? With the party back, you didn't didn't think you were going to get, uh, you were going to win? Nope. Nope. Uh, well, I never thought I'd win the party nomination. Start there, let alone win, basically, I don't remember if it was 70 or 80 percent of the votes. So the fine did that. That was easier. That's a pool. You can actually call a thousand people. You know, you can, you can know a thousand people. Then, 
suddenly, you know, you've got the province of Alberta in a provincial election and 87 seats. And I didn't have a clue, but I had a fabulous team, like fabulous team. And we got together one Sunday afternoon at our apartment in Calgary. And basically we said, okay, we're the dog that caught the car. We've caught the car. Now what? And one fellow who is particularly good at politics, a great liberal, you would know this person well, actually, uh, just said, Doug, you've won the party. The party's going to vote for you. It's all about the other communities in the province. So I went hard after the, the liberals in the province. I went hard after the arts community, the education community, the gay community, and the communities that would identify with me. And um, I still didn't think. I had no idea. We were having fun. I had no idea. And then, you know, when election night came and I got you know, something a little bit less than half a million votes, and how many people vote? 1.2 million or something? It was, I was stunned. Like I was speechless and I'm not often speechless. I just couldn't. In fact, my son was figuring out at the end, he said, Dad, like, you won this. And you won this hugely. I said, Ian, I know you're good at all this stuff. But do it again. I, I got to think you're wrong. <laughs> Secretly, in a way, thinking, hmm, maybe he is wrong. But there it is. And then the prime minister of the day, Prime Minister Harper, appointed me. And that was then. And this is now. So walking on the Senate chambers after Stephen Harper, uh, the Prime Minister mm -hmm. of the time, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, appointed you. What was it like that moment walking on the Senate floor for the very first time? Oh, it's overpowering. I mean, you recognize that there have not been a thousand Canadians who've ever been a senator. And you're, you're being sworn in in front of your family. And I was lucky enough to have my mom and my dad and my kids and my mother-in-law and it was just fabulous day because you recognize you have achieved something which is meaningful and you've been given a privilege to contribute to the country you love. And your family's just obviously very happy, very, very happy for you. And of course, you're happy that they're happy, right? So it was, it was spectacular. It was a spectacular day. Was it daunting knowing the fact that you had so much uh, uh, power in some sense to potentially affect the day-to-day -day lives of every Canadian across Canada? Yeah, no, I viewed it as an opportunity. I thought, I, had, I now have an opportunity to assist Alberta within Canada. I, I viewed it as, I come, my background is corporate law. My background is uh, bringing groups, companies together. My background is not contentious. I don't litigate. I don't fight. My history is bringing people together. And I thought I have an opportunity to endeavor to do just that. And isn't that a great privilege? So that's what I felt. Again, that was then. This is now. Exactly. Right. Um, that first year, uh, we had the pleasure of talking in December of that first year when I was a well, reporter at Lloydminster. And uh, it was the first time a sitting sender had ever called a newsroom, I think, ever in my time as a journalist. So it was very mm -hmm. uh, appreciative. You had set out priorities of how you wanted to reform the upper chamber. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that you said was, I want live, I want this Senate floor to be broadcasted just like the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. I remember that because I was so much in favor of that as well. Totally, totally. In 2019, that reality became true. You started, the Senate started broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has changed the Senate for better or for worse? I think for better. How so? I, well, because once light is on anything, people activities, animals behave differently. And so I think there's a, a bit more focus on people's statements. I think there's a bit more uh, regard for the power of your words. That's what I would like to believe. Um, no, so I, th I, think it, I think it's made a real difference. I think it's made a real difference. I think people are a little more focused on questions and question period. I think people should be. I think most people are focused on the comments in debate uh, that they don't want to look like idiots. Who wants to look like an idiot, let alone before 
you know, an audience. So no, I, th I think it's made a difference. Furthermore, I'm a huge believer in transparency. You'll also remember, because you've obviously gone into the history, I was, I was the first senator that called for transparency of expenses. I was the first senator to put my complete expense record online. The first one ever, 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 ever. Yeah. Now, of course, that's just, that's done by the Senate. That, that gets done by others. Because I believe that good decisions are taken when people feel accountable and people feel accountable if people understand what they're doing. And so I, that's why I pushed for broadcasting. And that was a rapid decision. That only took five years, like warp speed, right? I pushed for... Uh, independent audit of senators' expenses, and that just got approved last week. Just last week, we need an, you know, there should be an audit committee, and that audit committee should have independent members. Every organization in the world does that, so the Senate's going to do that. And you know, I called for that seven or so years ago. I called for transparency of expenses, and I can remember some of the reaction I got from a number of my colleagues when I did that, like. And, you know, I was cut off a number of Christmas card lists. We'll just leave it at that. But I'm, I'm of the view that I'm an elected senator and I have an obligation and a response to let people know how I'm spending their money. And it also focuses your mind, too. And what have Canadians said to you since uh, the Senate has started posting the expenses online, since the broadcast of the Senate chamber has gone live, what are Canadians saying to you that it is more transparent? Are you getting feedback that people are actually tuning in or are people still unaware of the fact that this is going on? I think on the whole, people are unaware that it's going on, but to your larger question, when I'm moving around Alberta, maybe that's why I miss moving around Alberta now, people know that I'm working hard for them. There's absolutely no doubt. Not everyone agrees with positions I take. That's fair enough. But nobody that ever talks to me ever says anything other than, Senator, thank you. We know you're working hard for us. I get that every time I'm out. In fact, it's kind of unusual for me to go into a coffee shop now and buy my own coffee. It's a perfect arrangement. <laughs> you know, because people will come up and say, look, your senator, because they usually don't know me, and they say, you know, we really appreciate what you're doing for Alberta. We know how tough this is. We know how hard you're working. And I find that overpoweringly gratifying because sometimes you feel you're working in a cave somewhere with no light to no sound. But people do follow. You know, I have a large social media following. We're attentive to that. Uh, I travel. I'm virtually out. I have call lists every day. I keep my pulse on what's happening in Alberta. And Albertans now, after seven or eight years of it, know it. They know it and I feel it. And um, it's very, it's gratifying. It's very gratifying. But it's also, it reminds me that I have a serious job that's far from done. Far from done. Which, like I said, we will talk about the policy here yeah, because yeah, there are a lot yeah. of things that we need to digest here. You bet. Uh, uh, one of the areas that I do want to talk about, though, is mm -hmm. the decision to leave the Conservative caucus in 2016. Right. Sure. That's to sit, to, have, sit, to have, sit as an independent senator for a while and then join the I want to make sure I get the t uh, name here right. Canadian the, Senators Group. Canadian Senators Group. What was that? How hard was that decision? Because you were elected as a conservative senator or a progressive conservative senator. Uh, you were sitting with the conservative caucus and then you decided to leave them. How hard was that? Not hard at all. Why did you Not do it that? Not hard at all. I'll tell you exactly why I did it. I'm, I was elected to represent Albertans. I was elected to take my best judgment on the issues that came before us. I was not elected to be part of a collective. I was not elected to debate in private a decision and then act on a decision that I may or may not have agreed with. Um, I'm not a particularly good team player, to be frank with you. I mean, the sports that I always did were 
I swam, I ran, I cycled, I rode, things where I depended on myself. And so consequently, I'm not disruptive at any level, I don't think, but it just, it came to the point for me with the conservatives. And I'll note an important point on timing. I did not leave until Stephen Harper left because he appointed me. And so I felt a loyalty to him and not because he appointed me and as an Albertan and as a former prime minister. So Stephen went first. And then when Stephen left and there was new leadership and new leadership in the Senate as well, uh, I, I did not not personal. In fact, I, I likely am on better terms with many of my colleagues in the, my, my former colleagues in the Conservative caucus and then in other caucuses because we have the same intellectual alignment. But I am not good at... Uh, pretending that I support things if I don't. I'm not good if Albertan interests are not being advanced in a way that I think is appropriate. So that is exactly what I did. You will also recall, we won't get into this in any detail, but the background to a lot of this was we had all of the fuss around Mike Duffy and Pamela Wall and, and Patrick Brazo raising in the background. And I have a highly defined sense of what's right and what's wrong. Nothing to do with me being a lawyer, but because I watched how my parents operated. I, my parents ran a drugstore. So you deal with everybody in a drugstore. And I watched how my parents treated, you know, the folks who run, you know, some big oil company in Calgary and the folks who were coming in to buy aftershave to drink. So you watch how people are dealt with. And you have a develop a sense, and I did, from watching my parents as to what's right and what's wrong. And I think to this day that the way that Senators Duffy and Wallen was treated was inappropriate, was completely inappropriate, as the court ultimately showed us all. Right? That's true. Yeah. I mean, they could have saved a lot of time if they just listened to some of us. But um, it was a nasty, vicious political time. And I am not built for that at all. I'm not criticizing others, each to their own. I just voted with my feet, right? Now, and then I moved to the independent. I didn't really move to the independence. I went to sit behind my friend, Peter Harder, who was a pal of mine, and then led the uh, government in the Senate. And, I, and then the, the, the prime minister started to appoint a lot of senators <clears throat> And I morphed more or less into that group because I didn't really have a group. So I kind of morphed into that group, but I was never aligned politically, never aligned politically with many of the new appointees. Fabulous Canadians, extraordinarily gifted some of these individuals, but the, my political alignment was just not there. And we were coming into a series of very real battles on behalf of Alberta and um, I needed to have I needed to have full independence to prosecute what needed to be prosecuted. So, my friend Scott Tannis, there's two elected senators, myself and Scott. Uh, my friend Scott Tannis and I had a chat, and uh, let's just say we were aligned. So we said, you know, let's play some calls. So we did, and and my caveat was Scott. You're going to lead it because I am not going to lead it. That's not what I do in the Senate. And Scott agreed, and he's a great leader. So, you know, we're, we're doing our thing. And I, you know, I, I think we're bringing value. I think we're bringing value. So for someone who literally just said five to seven minutes ago that he was not a team player, how do you join a group that is a team now? Because we are aligned. There is, there is an alignment that often doesn't exist in groups. The politics, oddly enough, amongst that group, now it's not big. The group is not big. It's 13 or 14 members. We are aligned. So think of rowing. And I did a lot of rowing. I did a lot of rowing at school. Everyone is in the boat and everyone's cadence is the same. And the coxswain who is in charge of the boat is Scott, to follow his analogy through. We understand where we're going. We understand how we're going to get there and we are rowing together and i hope that that continues you know i hope that that continues we'll see 
And do you find that you have the freedom to uh, vote your conscience and vote oh, in the way that? Oh, one hundred percent. Oh, ab- oh, absolutely. One of one of the tenets of our new group is that we have no group positions. Okay. You know, so we talk about things obviously because you learn from people. I have a conversation with you, and I learn about stuff. And then you take your decision, you know, the best decision that you possibly can. So for me, this is working, but I am not at all concerned about what badge I wear other than I'm an elected senator from Alberta and Albertans expect me every day to prosecute the interests that are that Alberta needs prosecuted. And they don't care how the sausage get made. Nobody cares about that. You know, and so no one, I will tell you, other than you, maybe, maybe when I first made the move from the conservatives, maybe somebody else has asked me about this. In the world where people are operating, they don't care. They don't care. They look to me as elected senator to say, Doug, you know, tell us about Bill C-69. Tell us about no border crossings. Tell us about airport lights at Calgary Airport or whatever the concerns are. That's where people live. And that's why I travel in the province all the time, because otherwise I cannot know what's on people's minds. Because you can't, if you, you, um, you either make stuff up or people tell you things they think you want to hear. And that doesn't work for me. And again, I learned that from the law. It's called due diligence. You know, you find out what's behind something. So take an example, the issue now around potential opening up for coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Rockies. So people tell me stuff. So I'm going to go down there and I'm going to meet with Reeves and I'm going to meet with developers and I'm going to meet with local residents, ranchers, so I can take my own conclusion as to what is best for Alberta. That's, that is the fabulous privilege of this job is you have a platform to which people will respond. Do you listen to both sides of the debate? Always, 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 always. And I know, I know that again, having watched my parents and certainly in the law, you learn that very quickly. There are always two sides. There's usually more than two sides, you know, and that's why you know, partisan, you know, the whole concept of being a partisan, it's not my cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea because nobody owns all the good ideas. So don't pretend you do, because if you start to tell me you own all the good ideas, I'm going to quickly think he is full of something, right? <laughs> maybe himself, maybe something else. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Like on my tour, to, my virtual tour to Edmonton this week, I will talk to the president of the University of Alberta, and I'll talk to the president of the student union at the University of Alberta. I will talk to the Alberta Enterprise Group, and I will talk to the leader of the Alberta Federation of Labor. That's how you learn. That's how you learn. I'll talk, I'll talk to the, the leader, the CEO of the United Way. Like, how is it on the street? I always visit one or two social service agencies every time I move around the province or when I'm in Calgary, because I want to know how the most vulnerable are being cared for. I want to talk to those people and I want to know what's on their mind because they are people. We sometimes forget that we, we sometimes make people we don't understand invisible. People aren't invisible. That's true. Um, you, you're segue, segueing into my next set of questions here, and you set it up quite perfectly with your comments on Bill C-69. Um, this is a bill that, from the start, you did not like, you were not in favor of. Can you explain why? Well, I not only can explain why, I can give you evidence as to why. In the next day or two, in the Calgary Herald, and I've done an op-ed on 69. <clears throat> and to your point, I have my own views, but I convened two weeks ago a roundtable of First Nations leaders, of think tanks, of every association in Canada, including the Canadian Mining Association, who are in favor of Bill C-69, to have what I call the 69 check-in. 
because I know my own view, but I wanted to talk to the folks who actually are supposed to be building projects. And this is just not pipelines. We had the Port Association, we had the Airport Association, we had the renewables, we had the nuclear, we had the gas, we had the chemicals, we had them all. Development projects have stopped in this country. Investment has, we know, has fled the country, is has continued to flee the country. And indeed, Canadian companies are moving outside of the country to make their investments. So I there's no glory or happiness in being in the position of I told you so. But I'm just telling you, this piece of legislation is drastic for Alberta and it's drastic for Canada. There was talk at the time, oh, Senator, you're overreacting. Of course, the regulations we'll deal with is in a much more progressive, easier, uh, more enlightened fashion. Two problems with that. One, it's not so. And B, as a lawyer, I know that's not how the system works. That's just not how it works. And it isn't the case because the federal government has weighed in pretty dramatically on a couple of mining projects, the Castle Project in British Columbia and a project in Alberta, where they are clearly provincial jurisdiction. So what has happened is I'm a project developer and I'm going, I'm saying, look, I haven't got the energy. I haven't got the capital. I haven't got the time to develop projects in Canada. And this is a serious problem for the nation. And, you know, I built a substantial coalition. Let's just review it. Every association in Canada, but the mining association who have now altered their point of view. Every government in the province, in the country, but the government of British Columbia and all of the territories, every premier, but the premier of British Columbia, labor unions, coast to coast to coast, an overwhelming coalition trying to convince the government this is bad policy. Unfortunately, we ran smack into what they believe is good policy, which is honoring their commitments on the Paris protocols for climate change. So fine, good. They're the government. They're entitled to advance their policies agenda. and yep. their agenda. Correct. And that's exactly what they're doing. And Alberta is being penalized because of that. Is it even worse now with the pandemic going on? Because I know uh, there has been layoffs, like even this month, Suncor just announced that they're going to be laying mm -hmm. off 2000 people. Uh, RBC just came out earlier this month and said they are not going, they're going to be rethinking loaning any money to any oil and gas uh, new ad adventure. H how has this pandemic and Bill C-69 double whammied Alberta into potential economic collapse? Yeah, I want to talk about that, where we are going to go from here. So let's do a snapshot today and then we'll talk about where I think we can go. Okay. And arguably should go. So today, you're absolutely right. It is a calamity. It is a calamity in this province like I have never seen. And I, you know, I've been in Alberta and I was born in Calgary. I, I've been here. I've seen every bump in the road. There is no comparative point to this now. Um. The National Energy Program, when pre Peter Lougheed was the premier, would be the next, would be the runner-up, you know, would be, would be the runner-up to this. And so we have a terrible circumstance. So we got price of oil. We had the Saudis and the Russians having their spat. So oil has yeah. fallen. What is it today? It's a little below 40, but it's around $40. Fine. So we had that. Then we had COVID. Okay. And it's just not us. The whole world has COVID. That's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but we all deal with that. What we have not had and is so problematic for Alberta is we have a government who is hellbent on enacting a series of policies to advance their interests, which I've said they're entitled to do. They're the government, but the fallout from them moving down that policy line 
is extraordinarily detrimental to Alberta. So we have 69. We have the fact that they imposed through a bill called C-48, a tanker ban. Well, the effect of a tanker ban, this was all wrapped up in sunsets off British Columbia and seals and movement of fish and grasses and whatnot. Those are all important issues, all of which can and are being addressed. This was aimed at preventing the movement of heavy oil from Fort McMurray to the coast of Canada, the north coast of British Columbia. Discriminatory, prejudicial, detrimental to First Nations prosperity, but it was a throw-off promise that the Prime Minister made, you know, over a latte in Vancouver one day. So it had to be fulfilled. And there is no other oil tanker ban in the world. There's one in the world. It is astonishing. And then, I mean, you look anywhere you want to look, and I don't want to seem angry. I'm not angry. I'm, I'm a realist. Facts are facts. No. You look at the grants from the Canada Council of the Arts. Just look at those one day and compare how many of those grants go to Ontario and Quebec artists and how many go to Alberta artists. And even if you want to be just really mathematical, just compare populations and then have a look. You will see that we are dramatically year over year over year. Look at the Order of Canada announcements. Look at border crossings between Alberta and the U.S. I mean, I could go on and on and on. We are treated like an ATM machine by Ottawa. That is what I have come to learn over the last number of years. To my incredible disappointment, but it is what it is. So that's where Alberta is today, and that's what we have to figure out how to fix. How do we fix that, though? Because that seems like uh, even with a change of government, let's say if mm-hmm. Trudeau mm-hmm. loses the next election and mm-hmm. uh, Aaron O'Toole becomes, it's not mm-hmm. going to fix overnight because BC is still going to have their issues with pipelines. There's going to be First Nations off reserves who are going to have issues with putting a pipeline through their territory. So how do you fix it? it? It is not a simple fix, is it? No. Oh, no, no. It's not a simple fix at all. I would tell you, though, that a change of a government with policies which are more accommodating towards industrial development writ large in Canada would be helpful, but we can't plan on that. So I have some experience around this because foreseeing this about four years or so ago, I brought together with Joe Doucette, who's the Dean of Business at the University of Alberta, a group of 70 leading Albertans and not just in business, but in First Nations, in unions, in youth, in the arts, in the gay community. We brought folks together and we came up with a, we called the project Alberta 2.0. Because we knew, we knew then what, where, where the energy, the oil and gas industry was going. And that's fine. It's in transition. It is in transition. BP will tell you that. Shell will tell Everyone will tell you. We all know it's in transition. Historically in Alberta, what we have seen is we get our head in a knot. The price of oil falls. We get our head in a knot. We might even light our hair on fire. The price of oil goes up again, and we go for lunch. Right? That's what we do. You know, that's just what we do. That's not going to work this time. So consequently, we've got to be a lot smarter, and we will around renewables around hydro hydrogen i suspect you could define as a renewable uh the whole innovation sector the whole tech sector the innovation sector just a great piece of news yesterday with the the professor at the university of alberta winning a nobel prize in medicine this underlines to the world that alberta is serious about science and serious about technology and serious about you know biomedical things. So this is all good for us. Agriculture is huge, absolutely huge. And that's why in the infrastructure bank announcement of last week, the announcement that there'll be money for irrigation, I applaud. That is important because it takes land that is currently effectively Southern Alberta desert and converts it to allowing us to grow other products. So we need to focus on, obviously, getting the GHG and carbon uh, footprint of our existing oil and gas uh, products to zero. 
That has to be the goal. We have to focus on renewables writ large, and we can and we will, not only um, for our consumption, but also from a manufacturing point of view and from a technology point of view. And all this, all the pieces are there through the universities and through the various organizations and the enterprise groups through the province. It just needs to be knit together. And there's agriculture and there's forestry and there's tourism. There's a lot that we can do. And I just hope that the pennies drop to recognize now we must do something about it because nobody else is going to do it for us. Do Albertans have the appetite to do it, though? Because you talk about what we can do, the different sectors we can diversify in. But it seems and I've only been an Albertan for seven years now. It's the hamster wheel. You're just on the hamster wheel and we just keep on going in a circle and there's no really movement forward or backwards. It's just we're doing the same thing over and over again. We currently have a premier in office who is trying to get things done, things changed. But with the pace of government, as you said, five years to live stream broadcast the Senate floor seems like a quick timeline. But in the grand scheme of things, Alberta can't wait. So do Albertans, in your opinion, have the appetite to make the dramatic changes that needs to happen to potentially get us off of this reliance on uh, Mm -hmm. Ottawa? Well, that is the big question, isn't it? That is the big question. Uh, We're going to see. I'm an optimist. I believe the answer is yes, because... The outcome of not embracing a new future is declining incomes, declining population, declining GDP, uh, and all of the things that are not the Alberta that I certainly know. So I believe that the answer to your question is yes, we have the appetite because we've been frightened. Suddenly, Suddenly, it's this is like this is a real problem. The price of oil is not going back up to eighty bucks a barrel. The price of gas is not going to recover in the short term, if at all. The Alberta finances are the governmental finances are a disaster. You know, a disaster. It's all got to be brought under control, and that's going to mean some very very tough decisions. But I will tell you, I'm just I'm on this virtual tour. And I have completed Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and Red Deer so far. And I talked to wide, as I've indicated to you, wide swaths of citizens, leaders, community builders, citizens in every community. And I am just struck, absolutely struck, because I was expecting a bit of, oh, my God, Senator, the sky has fallen. What are we going to do? Ottawa has given us the boots, et cetera. mm mm I've heard nothing but resilience and nothing but compassion. Interview over interview over interview. And I don't feed that to people. I'm just listening. I'm just trying to to listen to get a sense of how the community is doing and how I can be helpful. But whether or not you're running the the women's shelter in Medicine Hat or the Sugar Beet Association in Lethbridge, people are committed to making change, to make their communities, their organizations, their structure, their cities better. They're not focused on a lot of what you and I are now talking about now, around the politics of it. They kind of know it's not working. They know Ottawa is not their friend. There's a sense we can't count on Ottawa to help us out if we ever could. And by the way, in recent history, Alberta never has. I mean, the numbers are the numbers. It's hundreds of billions of dollars have moved from Alberta to the rest of Canada, for which we're grateful that we can do that. I'm sorry, that's this. I beg your pardon. No um, so um, I believe with the right leadership that people are prepared to dig deep to ensure that we have built a better province for our kids and grandkids. I really believe that. I believe that. And I talk to enough people. Now, maybe I'm just talking to the committed I mean, that's a possibility too, isn't it? Um, the people feel that we have an obligation to the next generation, in which you would fall, incidentally, to get this smartened up. You know, 
<laughs> we got we got to do a little bit of cleanup here. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. You talked about how Albertans, as you've talked to them, have felt for years, not just in the last two years, not in the last three years, but for years, have been getting shortchanged by uh, uh, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. This is not just the first prime minister to give money not to Alberta, but to B.C., to Toronto, Mm -hmm. to Montreal. Mm -hmm. Stephen Harper did it. Paul Martin did it. John Cretchen Mm -hmm. did it. So it's not a liberal or conservative thing. It's a Alberta versus Ottawa uh, mentality, do you think? I think I think there's a nature of the country. I, I haven't quite figured this out yet, but I spent a great deal of time in the East. Obviously, that's where my job is. And there is a sense that the regions of Canada and Alberta is a region, the West is a region, and the Atlantic is a region, aren't full partners. And there's a number of reasons for that. History is obviously one reason. Um, bilingualism is another reason. Um, maybe our inability to communicate our messages as clearly as we might or as succinctly as we might might be another reason. We are underrepresented in the House of Commons. We are dramatically underrepresented in the Senate. Quebec is guaranteed three seats on the Supreme Court of Canada out of nine. The Prairie Provinces are guaranteed one. The federal court judges all must sit in Ottawa. So I'm a leading practitioner in Vancouver. I'm going to pick up stakes and move to Ottawa? Don't think so. So, I mean, the whole system has been structured historically to exclude the regions. Now, Was that an intent? I have no idea whether that was an intent or not. But that is how it plays out. That is how it plays out. So we are in the circumstance now where Albertans are saying to me, Senator, what did we do to Ottawa to make them so annoyed at us? Like, what did we do? And I said, no, no, I, I, I don't think it's personal. I actually don't think it's personal. I just think it's completely different wavelengths. We have a point of view which is very entrepreneurial, very get it done, very resilient, as I have seen over the last couple of weeks. No sense that someone's going to take care of you. Like You don't have that sense. You have the sense that you better get up and get your podcast going and do the work you're doing or you know, you're not going out for beers this Friday. It's just, there's a different mentality altogether. The media is sent, I mean, the, the, the influential media is centered in central Canada. The links are centered in Toronto. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So we have a system where it's structurally imbalanced and fine. Then we, because of our wealth, have been able, and because of the equalization system, which that fine, we won't get into the merits of that, but it is a system which is designed to reallocate funds, fine. And Canada's decided that's what they want to do. But it means that we, in Alberta, for decades, we have carried the freight on that program. And now we're in a situation where we need some financial help. And there is no help coming. There is no help coming. We're asking for six billion bucks in terms of this fiscal stabilization number. Well, since, as I'm repeating, over the last decades, we've given over $600 billion to the center. And we're just getting, you know, what I get is, you know, why don't you guys put in a sales tax? Like, and, and by the way, Senator, why don't you stop whining on behalf of the energy industry? I get that. I get that. And it is not occasionally. I get that. Because for the, I, the, the series of reasons I've indicated. So where does that take you? That takes me to, be, to the belief that we need to, we need to build the Alberta we want to see. I don't know what that looks like. 
I don't know how that works, but I know to your hamster analogy of earlier, I think about that analogy of hitting your head on the wall and thinking you're going to get a different result by hitting your head on the wall other than a headache. It's called insanity. To continue doing the same thing and expect you to get a different result. Like the problem is not you, the problem is me. So this is what's going on now, I think, in the province in Hague and Tech and government, you know, provincial government, municipalities. Uh, how do we figure this out? And, you know, we're going to figure it out. There's no doubt. And when we have a conversation, I would say maybe three years from now, we're going to see some really exciting things have happened. Really exciting things have happened where Albertans have figured, okay, we need to figure it out. And we're going to figure it out because we can figure it out. We have the resources. We are still a very rich province. We're a very rich province. And more important than the money, we have the youngest, most highly educated population in the country, which we must keep. We must keep. And... Uh, uh we only will keep it. People see those opportunities. Before I go into my next subject, there is one topic that you sort of talked about a little bit, but I want to get you on record here. Um, we have seen in the last year and a half the rise of Western separatization in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People, former conservative MP Jay Hill is the leader of the Maverick Party. As a Canadian mm -hmm. senator mm -hmm. from Alberta, what's your thoughts on this? I don't think that's the answer, you know, I, and I've told Jay that he knows that's my view. And, um, you know, the folks in the map, the, yeah, I guess it's the Maverick party now and the Buffalo project, they understand that I believe that this is not the way forward. Conversely, I do not believe that the current situation is the way forward either. I mean, to, to hearken back to my analogy, um, we are an ATM machine. And that's not right. That's not appropriate. That engenders a real risk to national unity, of which I've spoken of in the Senate. You know, I've endeavored to alert my colleagues to the fact that there is a real potential here for a national unity challenge based upon Albertans' feeling of complete and absolute neglect. Even worse than neglect under this government attacks against our ability to earn a living. Um, but so we need to we need to find a middle way. There needs to be a middle way needs to be found. And there are precedents in this country. Now, I don't presume to be the expert on this, but it seems to be working very well in the province of Quebec. The province of Quebec seems to have figured out how to achieve their objectives while achieving Ottawa's objectives. So I would be looking pretty carefully at that playbook to see what have they done around immigration? What have they done around policing? What have they done around investment funds? What have they done around tech? What have they done? Because whatever they've done seems outside looking in, seems to be pretty doggone effective to me. So I would be having a good look if I were, you know, the government of Alberta, I'd be having a good look at the Quebec model. I just want to offer one other thought. We all have our views on the American government currently. And, you know, this will be resolved, one presumes, in the next three or four weeks. But you would have noticed they're obviously following these discussions in Canada closely as well, the tensions between the West and the center and whatnot. Don't you find it kind of interesting that out of the blue on a Sunday, there'd be a presidential permit for the A2A railway from Fort Mac to Alaska? You, Is it just you, me? You're the king of transitions, because that's literally my next question there, Senator. No way. It was. No way. It was. Well, we got to do this more often. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, I just find that really fascinating. So Trump announces so, that he's approving the uh, mm -hmm. railway from, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure where in Alberta. Fort to Mac. Al Fort, Fort Mac, Mac to yeah, Alaska. Alaska. Literally a day later, Justin Trudeau comes out and says, we might have to look into this. We're not sure if it's going to go through. We're going to use what's in our dispens dispensary with Bill 69. This is a huge 
move by Trump Correct. to try and get our oil <laughs> and then Trudeau <laughs> to say, you know what? We don't want it. We don't want to give it to you. What, what are your thoughts on a, that project to begin with and B where we're moving forward to get our oil to our biggest uh, a customer of the United yeah. States? Well, uh, I mean, pipelines. <laughs> It just you have to sit back and recognize he knows when to put the, what is it the the wolf amongst the pigeons or whatever it is I mean it's an incredibly devious uh, political move which I kind of stand up and say very good thinking there because it clearly has crystallized uh, an issue which they understand we all understand. Our big beef is you, Ottawa, have prevented us and are preventing us from legitimately getting our products to international markets. There's no other product in Canada that you do that with. Cars, no. Airplanes, no. Uh, you know, grains, no. Potash, no. Uh-uh. Just oil and gas from Alberta. So... That's why we've had these pipeline wars. And you make a good point as well. I mean, it was the conservatives before the liberals that did not approve. I mean, Jason or Justin actually killed it. But the conservatives before them, they were not great friends of the Keystone Project. I mean, they just were not great friends of the Keystone Project. And so it, it got into trouble that the company simply couldn't manage, similarly with Trans Mountain. So that's what we need. We need a, we need a pipeline to the West Coast in order to get our product, principally to Asia. And we can't with this government, and we never will with C-69. So the Americans have seen that. So they have said, we're your good neighbor and friend. We can get your product, albeit to our port, but we can get your product to our port. Hardball, man. It, it, it has thrown a new wrench into uh American Canadian uh, relations, I would imagine, because uh, while Stephen Harper and Barack Obama didn't see eye to eye, Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump do really do not see eye to eye at the end of the day. So you have two political parties, two opposing figures who one, like you said, is genius of saying, we'll take your oil to our border. And our prime minister is saying, well, wait, whoa, 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 we didn't want, whoa, this is, this is not what I expected. Mm -hmm. So do you see it being approved in a, in your fortune teller mindset? Do you potentially see, because this is not a pipeline, right? This is not a pipeline. This is rail. Do you see it which, being approved? Which incident, which incidentally is riskier than a pipeline. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the irony of all of this debate is pipelines are 99.9%. .9%, even the opposition says uh, safe, but, but fine. Do I see it being approved? Um, it's potential that it could be approved. It will take a period of time, but I see it as being a huge bargaining chip, huge bargaining chip, not only in terms of the pipeline politics, but in terms of the national unity conversation. I mean, it's, you know, I could see an argument where Edmonton could look at Ottawa and say, look, it's all bad enough that you won't let us export our products through a Canadian port. Now you're telling us we can not export our products through a foreign nations port. I mean, it just it makes a complicated situation more complicated and potentially more volatile. And I am. Uh, I don't know what the word is, suspicious enough, uh, old enough to recognize that the presidential permit was no accident. He didn't wake up <laughs> in the morning and think, I bet I should do a presidential permit. Now, where will I do a presidential permit? Well, why not Fort McMurray to Alaska? I mean, really? I think I found it just incredible. So which is to say the game is still on, but we in Alberta cannot wait for the end of the A to A game or the Keystone game, we we need to continue to advance our interests to build Alberta 2.0. And that's what I've been advocating for four years. And that's what I'm back on encouraging people to do. And we will do it. I have no doubt we will do it.
We have like three minutes, but I have one section that I want to touch on briefly, if that's okay with you. Um, Sure. The the Senate has sat, according to CBC, that was just released this week, 14 days as the whole chamber this year. This year alone, 14 days. Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Gold's motion just passed. Virtual sittings are going to be coming up here soon. You're going to be able to be that sober second thought. What can we expect from the Senate in the remainder of 2020? Yeah, well, let me just say in terms of the point you made, I find that outrageous. And I have been making that point privately since March, as has our group, the Canadian Senators Group, have been saying privately, this is an outrage. We are the only chamber in the Western world that is not having virtual hearings. So figure it out push back, push back, push back, push back. So two weeks ago, uh, we, we, our little Canadian senators group put a pin in it and said, Senator Gold, until we come to hybrid settings, settings, we will not give you the consent that you need in order to pass legislation. Cause there are certain things have to be unanimously passed in the Senate. And if we don't do that, then all kinds of things that you want done will simply freeze. The log jam got broken last week. I'm told we'll start hybrid sittings on the 29th of this month. And I wanted to underline the point that we're doing that because our Canadian senators group blew the whistle and said, until you get this figured out, we're not going to give you the consent you need to advance any work in the Senate. So, you know, a bit of a a bit of a dig in, but we had to dig in because we're the only chamber. We were the only chamber in the Western world not sitting completely unacceptable. So we blew the whistle. We got a result. and I'm looking forward to it. And my last question, Senator, before I leave you, um, 2021, looking forward, what's your priority to get Alberta's interests advocated in in Ottawa for you? My priority in 2021 is to ensure that Alberta starts to aggressively move around what I'm calling Alberta 2.0, the Alberta 2.0 agenda. I am putting tremendous personal time into the innovation uh, world, working with people to bring organizations together so we're working together. I'm going on an agricultural tour very, very early in the, the, as soon as I possibly can, because ag matters, oils matters to us, irrigation matters to us. We gotta get this figured out. I'm working closely with the provincial government to help them on other fronts as well with a view to ensuring that innovation, jobs, and economy work in this province. That's my commitment, and uh, I will keep at it, just like I've kept at it in 2020 and 2019, 2018. I just am hoping at some point we're going to get a satisfactory result. Well, I, I know with you in the Senate, we will get that one day. Oh, maybe, bless maybe, you. I don't... <laughs> maybe in another five years, the speed that this government goes. <laughs> well, I'm doing, as I think Albertans know, I'm doing all I possibly can to advance our interests. And I am extre- extremely grateful to Albertans who are giving me this privilege. Uh, Senator, once again, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly oh, Delightful it. to speak with you, Chris. Delightful to speak with you. And we'll do it again. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.